All right, in 15.3, we are gonna talk about a very important process of the adaptive immune system called the inflammatory response. Uh, you probably have heard of inflammation. We're gonna lay out what the signs of it are so that we can recognize it. We're also gonna talk about what's going on in there. We tend to think of inflammation as bad, but uh, there are very necessary things going on in inflammation. It can be bad, though, uh, when it goes on too long. So we will talk about chronic inflammation. Okay, so what is inflammation and how does it develop? Inflammation is a critical part of the innate system. Uh, when uh, microbes get in, uh, it is a way to allow phagocytic cells, such as neutrophils, to enter the infected tissue. So we have things like neutrophils um, floating around in the blood system, but we need to get them to the site of a wound. So here is like, uh, I don't know, probably an infected um, ingrown hair or something like that. The movement of these phagocytic cells out of the blood vessels and to the site of uh, the wound is called extra vasation. So extra meaning moving outside of and vas vaso being the blood system, um, the vascular system. So there are several key things that you will probably recognize here. We have five signs of inflammation. These are HERPA is the acronym for it. We have heat, right? So uh, if you look at this, you can probably even feel it yourself, right? It's, it's hot. Um, it's going to be hot. So warmth, that warmth is actually coming from uh, blood moving to that area. That's also edema, which is swelling from fluid accumulation. Again, that's the blood and uh, lymph and stuff moving there. The redness, again, blood moving to the area. Pain, pain is activated by nerves in the region. And basically, it's a signal to our body to, hey, don't mess with that area, right? Like you got a big cut on there. Don't be poking it or stuff like that. It hurts because uh, you shouldn't be touching it. And then we often see altered function or movement at a site when there is inflammation. So if it's in a joint or something like that, um, or if you have lots of pain, you can't move the area right. So these first um, three parts are all really related to what we're gonna talk about, vasodilation and stuff like that. We categorize inflammation into either acute, which is short lasting inflammation, a few days, maybe a week, to chronic, which is something that lasts much longer and be chronic can be very difficult to deal with and can have negative consequences. This short initial inflammatory response is actually very beneficial. So we're gonna first watch the animation of what's going on in inflammation, and then we will break down the steps here. Although many things can trigger inflammation, our focus here is on how microbes cause the response. The process begins with the infection itself. Microorganisms trigger inflammation when they're introduced into the body and begin to grow and produce compounds that damage host cells. Resident immune cells, called macrophages, wander into the infected area and engulf and digest the invading organisms. They help to clean up the infection and, in the process, release inflammatory mediators, chemicals that call for more help. Some of these chemicals increase vascular permeability and stimulate vasodilation. Others are small proteins called cytokines that are made and secreted by cells as a way to communicate with other cells. Here they diffuse into the vasculature and stimulate endothelial cells to express specific receptors called selectins. Selectin binds to carbohydrates on the surface of neutrophils, snagging the cells as they flow by in the bloodstream and slowing them down, such that they roll along the endothelium. Inflammatory signals trigger these rolling neutrophils to express adhesion molecules called integrins on their surface. The integrins lock onto adhesion molecules called ICAM1 and VCAM1 on endothelial cells. The tight adhesion stops the rolling and the neutrophils begin to stretch out along the endothelial surface. Damaged tissue cells in the area of inflammation release bradykinin, a 9 amino acid polypeptide that helps loosen the tight junctions between endothelial cells. Neutrophils can now initiate extravasation in which they squeeze through the loosened endothelial wall and into the tissues where they can help macrophages attack the invading microbes. Bradykinin molecules also bind to other cells of the immune system, called mast cells, that are in the area, 
causing them to release histamine. The histamine further loosens the endothelial cell junctions, allowing more fluid in cells to move out of the capillaries. Bradykinin, when it attaches to capillary cells, induces the cells to synthesize prostaglandins. Prostaglandins stimulate nerve endings, causing pain, which draws awareness to the infected area. The five cardinal signs of inflammation are redness, warmth, pain, swelling, and altered function at the affected site. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. I don't need you to memorize things like bradykinin or integrins or ICAM-1, VCAM-2, uh, whatever. Uh, I, I want you to know what's going on in the process though, right? Uh, microbes get introduced, uh, macrophages engulf them, release signals that cause vasodilation, so opening of the um, uh, blood vessels. We had a little capillary there. Uh, neutrophils flow by and start to get stuck and then they'll move out through extra vasation out of the capillaries into the infected area and start attacking the bacteria there. There's also signals that are released like cytokines um, that uh, cause more fluid and stuff like that to be released that causes our swelling and our redness. Um, and then the pain aspect is released to draw awareness to that region. So I just want to remind you what's being used in here. We have different types of cells. We saw neutrophils in there. Those are our PMNs. We also saw macrophages. Both are phagocytic. The macrophages are kind of like sending out warning signals, though. The neutrophils are really coming in and cleaning up the bacteria that are in there. Mast cells were involved and in also uh, releasing signals in that process. So let's look at what's going on. Okay. So, right. So we had our skin. Uh, this is the subcutaneous tissue and stuff like that. Um, and we have capillaries in here. We have a sliver that's been introduced and it has microbes on it. The macrophages are going to recognize those and engulf them. And when they find them, they're going to uh, release cytokines, chemicals that kind of signal the alarm. So uh, we have signals in here that start inflammation, right? We have the microbes in them coming in, uh, macrophages release things. Um, microorganisms also produce compounds that are damaging to the cell. The macrophages, uh, they are antigen presenting, so they will also bring pieces of this to the adaptive system. They will also bring pieces of this to the adaptive system if this isn't dealt with just by the innate system by itself. Um, they release molecules that start that inflammation, like vasoactive factors that open the gaps between the endothelial cells. So endo means inside. Endothelium is the inside skin, right? Epithelium uh, is the outside skin. We have things like prostaglandins in there that signal pain, uh, cytokines that help signal other cells. Once we have this opening, we get uh, extra vasation, the movement of neutrophils out of the uh, bloodstream into the site of infection. So to do this, we have to have vasodilation, opening of the blood vessels here. Um, this helps uh, increase blood flow to that area and brings the neutrophils with it. This is going to cause swelling, redness, and the heat that we can feel from this. It's also going to stimulate the pain sensation and probably affect how that area moves. But ultimately, these macrophages and neutrophils could hopefully clean up the small number of microbes that are introduced before the adaptive system even needs to come in. So while they don't specifically know what bacteria this is, they know that it's a bacteria that shouldn't be there. So they just attack it and deal with it right away, hopefully before it starts to divide and multiply. So I would like you to have a good knowledge of this process because I think it is very important to what is occurring and you'll definitely want to talk about inflammation in your paper. Okay, uh, we're going to talk again about some of these cells in here. So just again, um, just have this diagram here to remind you. So let's look at a case study here. We have Constance. She's seven months old and she's suffering from recurring infections since she was two weeks old. So that is um, 
not great because children tend to have weakened immune systems, but they do have immune systems, right? They have the innate system and they shouldn't be getting sick constantly. They do get sick more, but not constantly. So she's frequently been admitted to the hospital for Staphylococcus aureus, sepsis, which is a blood infection, um, hepatosplenomegaly, which is an enlarged liver and spleen. She's also had oral thrush, which is a mouth infection caused by the yeast Candida albicans, and she has not gained weight well. So this uh, repeated infection here um, has required antibiotics that seem to temporarily resolve the infections, but they come back after that. So uh, her parents brought her to the ER two days ago, she was lethargic, didn't move a whole lot, had a high fever. So these are all indications that an infection is occurring. She's also struggling to breathe. So we look at her blood and we do uh, white blood cell counts. We find that the cell count is actually very, very high here. Um, we're way over the normal range. We're like five times as high as the normal range. So she fi they find a lot of neutrophils in her blood. So remember those neutrophils were the things coming out and engulfing the bacteria. They do a chest x-ray, shows inflammation, right? So here's a normal uh, chest and here's an inflamed chest with all these wisps in here. And they find that it is Staphylococcus aureus. Um, that's no surprise because she's had this infection a lot and it's also uh, gone into the bloodstream. So we're going to start intravenous antibiotics right away and uh, try to determine why this keeps coming back. Unfortunately, because of the repetitive nature here, the physicians suspect that there is something defective in Constance's immune system, which is not promising. So they're going to look at her lymphocyte number. Um, we're going to start with the actually the adaptive side here. So that's the lymphocytes and look at immunoglobulin. That's antibody levels and liver and kidney function as well. They all seem normal. So the other half of the immune system, the adaptive system, that seems to be working fine. So there must be some problem in the innate immune system. Flow cytometry, they use it to look at the surface proteins on Constance's uh, blood neutrophils, those things that were flowing through the blood. And this is where we find something very wrong. There is a critical membrane protein that is missing here, and that's not good news. So she has something called leukocyte adhesion deficiency, which is a genetic defect where the, leuco uh, the leukocytes, which are the uh, neutrophils, they don't make those proper proteins. So you remember they were rolling along and they got stuck on there? Well, these ones don't get stuck and they never move across the blood vessel. So they just kind of keep rolling. They don't adhere well to this. And that's bad because when she gets an infection, they are not leaving the bloodstream and moving to that infection site. So they're not sticky on the surface of the blood vessels and they never go out of circulation. That's why she has such a high number of them. Unfortunately, patients with LAD uh, generally don't survive beyond the age of two. There is no cure for this. There is no way to fix this genetic defect currently. So this is a very sad case where we see that the immune system, the innate immune system is super critical and without it, we cannot survive. So up until now, we've primarily been talking about acute inflammation, short little bouts, the infection is dealt with and it goes away. There are cases where inflammation lasts much longer. This is called chronic inflammation, and there are various causes of this. Um, one is the persistence of a foreign body in our tissue. So you get a splinter or a metal shaving or something like that that goes into your tissue. Sometimes if you don't remove that, the body activates inflammation and it keeps activating it. Um, and it does some silly things. Um, one thing it can do is just kind of wall off that area. It just builds what we call a granuloma, which is basically a wall surrounding whatever's irritating us. Um, so you can have little things in your body for long periods of time that just get uh, walled off. 
but this can be negative because long infections like mycobacterium tuberculosis, which we talked about, it uh, gets mistaken for these irritants. And sometimes our body walls off the bacteria. And so they're contained within these granulomas and they can just grow out of control. The immune system is not going in there and dealing with them. So they stay and they grow. And they keep coming out and keep reactivating inflammation. So it keeps activating the inflammation system, which uh, keeps disrupting the body and can be very painful and cause a lot of issues. It can kind of lead to false positives and things like this. Uh, the immune system gets activated, but then it can't find what it's supposed to attack and things like this. So that can be very bad for patients. So chronic inflammation is problematic. Acute inflammation, very good for us. Uh, it helps deal with these infections quite rapidly. Okay, inflammation, super critical process. Can't stress that enough. We have uh, extra vasation in there where the neutrophils move out of the bloodstream into the infected tissues. Macrophages are involved in there. They, they're the first ones to engulf the microbes and release those factors to start the vasoactive factors to start extravasation. We have cytokinins, um, which help uh, bring the neutrophils there. Um, we have a lot of molecules that signal that there's damage, like chemokines, um, and cytokines, things like that. They're going to summon the neutrophils. They're going to actually pull them towards the infection. Um, extravasation, that's opening up at the blood vessels. Um, we're not, don't worry about bradykinin too much. Um, helps helps do that as well and then we have this chronic inflammation that can occur um, primarily when we have like long infections or foreign objects that stay in the body okay that's it for 15.3